thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee, and thank you for you know, inviting me and to give me this opportunity to share some of our research results uh, with uh, people in Hong Kong. Uh, it's very exciting for me uh, to present our uh, study about uh, alcohol, uh, especially beer. Um, and uh, we um, were very happy to share uh, some of the new results with uh, everybody here. Uh, I understand it is uh, a very diverse audience. Uh, if you, uh, for the students, if you um, have trouble to understand what I'm saying as some special terminology, just uh, raise your hands. Uh, so I will try to answer as possible, as much as possible. Um, okay, uh, today we are, um, we're going to uh, discuss mainly three major questions. So I will go through those uh, um, questions through this lecture. Um, one is the origins of, uh, of alcohol. I understand many of the young students are under drinking age. So is, this is not encourage you to try <laughs> alcohol uh, before 18th, but uh, at least you will have some knowledge. When you reach the uh, drinking age, you can really enjoy it with, the, um, with uh, a new approach. So the origin of alcohol in universe and on Earth. So we we'll just mentioned briefly, and then we'll talk about um, why um, human invent alcohol, in what circumstances, and especially for what. I, and then I will talk about the, the development of the drinking traditions uh, in ancient China, as well as in the later period and uh, how it's related to Chinese civilization, uh, how it uh, become the core of the cultural values in China. Okay, so we start with the uh, remote, um, uh, some giant, uh, gigantic cloud in the space. Uh, so this is not my specialty. So don't ask me how they find out. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this is uh, what we know uh, based on scientific research. Uh, there's uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, giant clouds in uh, the universe, uh, very uh, far away. Uh, and full of uh, alcohol, and uh, drinkable alcohol. Uh, and uh, based on the study, and you can, um, for the whole, the entire population in the world, uh, you can drink for this alcohol for many, many years. And that is not just a, uh, the pure alcohol, it's a drinkable. So that is uh, fascinating. But is that related to the Earth? Uh, based on another study, uh, the uh, scientists believe uh, life may transfer from space through um, uh, comet, uh, as well as uh, uh, alcohol. So one type of comet uh, release alcohol, alcohol every second, and also very large quantity, and they may bring this alcohol to the Earth. So the alcohol, it seems to be uh, to exist very, very early before uh, human exist. And, and also we know that alcohol probably is in the DNA of a lot of uh, um, uh, animals or uh, human. Uh, we, we know many animals enjoy alcohol like uh, birds, and they can get drunk. And somehow um, the, you know, the behavior is very human, very like uh, human when they get drunk. And uh, there's famous drunken monkeys. So that is uh, the story everybody knows, right? And uh, monkeys and primates um, enjoy alcohol and they uh, get drunk. And as if the young people probably all know the story about the um, uh, monkey king, Sun Kung, uh, and we know he is also um, uh, the, uh, the crazy about alcohol, and uh, he make a lot of trouble uh, because of alcohol. Okay, so those are the animal world. Uh, how this alcohol related to human? And we, when we talk about the uh, alcohol on, uh, consumed or, or drunk by 
animals, bird or monkeys, those are naturally formatted. They don't make alcohol, right? So the monkeys would uh, um, drink the alcohol, it was naturally formatted from fruits like uh, uh, grapes or honey. So those were uh, the uh, material they can turn into alcohol just by natural process. But human, as what alcohol we are drinking, they were man-made. Uh, then the question is, how early human began to make alcohol? Uh, do we have any uh, evidence? So it seems the earliest uh, possible evidence can be traced back to um, at least uh, um, <clears throat> 20,000 years ago and to the Paleolithic period. And from uh, such as this uh, uh, carving is a, a female uh, figurine holding uh, a core, uh, holding a, 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 a whore, it's a kettle whore. And this kind of, uh, or called a drinking whore. Um, so many archeologists believe it represent uh, the uh, early shamanistic ritual behavior, uh, the shaman would drink alcohol and bring the trance then the, when they communicate with the supernaturals. Uh, and why they believe that? Uh, probably because the, the horn. And the horn is made of a wild cattle horn. Um, and uh, this type of uh, horn used as a drinking vessel continued in um, for very, very long time until uh, the civilization time. For example, we see Greeks, Roman, they use a um, horn drinking vessel. Um, and also we see uh, in Mesopotamia, uh, even in China, in Tang Dynasty, we still see the artifacts very much represent uh, the a cattle horn. Uh, and they are used as uh, drinking vessels. So we don't really know if that was true. The drinking um, habit started 20,000 years ago. Um, so what we archeologists want to uh, recover the evidence of drinking, we based on different method. It's not just the connection between the artistic representations, but we want to find uh, uh, concrete uh, evidence uh, through scientific analysis. So in order to talk about this uh, uh, reconstruction of alcohol consumption or um, um, the making and uh, a drinking process, we have to understand how the alcohol was made and a different material would make different alcohol. Uh, here is some examples. Um, alcohol can be made uh, with uh, either starchy food, like uh, grains, like uh, uh, barley, wheat, millet, rice, or ma uh, made of tubers. So the tubers also have a very uh, uh, high level of uh, starch. So any starchy food can be used for making alcohol. Uh, you can also use honey, because natural honey, if you mix 30% uh, honey, and come with 70% water, and then they start fermentation just by itself because the yeast would uh, exist in the honey. And a very similar situation with the grapes. Uh, you can uh, have grape wine just uh, uh, through the natural process. So these two um, uh, plants can turn, can turn into alcohol by itself and probably drunk by birds or monkeys. But this, um, starchy food have to go through some process of, uh, by a human intervention. Uh, and and uh, uh, another type, the last type, is uh, a typical uh, invented by the Chinese. It's the, we see uh, the, uh, these two plants we can see um, used by uh, other parts of the world in the old world and the new world, but uh, uh, this use uh, a uh, ferment, what's called qu, and together with the steamed rice or steamed other kind of grain, uh, make huangjiu, right? You're probably familiar with this. That's the same kind of cooking wine we use for, for 
you know, stir fry uh, as only made in China. So different material, different plants or could make different alcohol. So, uh, grain made barley, made beer, um, and tubers made chicha, and that is uh, uh, specially made in South America. I, and honey made the mead, uh, grapes make grape wine, uh, and this uh, chu and um, steamed grain made of yellow wine. Okay, so how, uh, I will just give you a little background how that the uh, raw material turn into alcohol. So if, if that is uh, starchy grain or starchy food, they need two process, two steps uh, from the uh, plants to alcohol. First, uh, it's uh, uh, starchy food um, turn into sugar uh, by enzymes. So the enzymes um, can be uh, activated um, in several ways and uh, then begin to convert uh, starch into sugar. And the second stage is uh, we call the fermentation. And uh, here you come with the yeast. The yeast convert sugar into ethanol and a carb carbon dioxide. So that is alcohol, together is alcohol. So we see a beer, you have bubbles, right? a lot of gas, that's a, a carbon dioxide, uh, and that together um, make the alcohol we, uh, drinkable. Uh, and uh, uh, the huangjiu, as we mentioned, is very different. Then you use qi and steamed grain, and then uh, through fermentation, uh, that make alcohol. Okay, so, uh, and these two steps, so we will emphasize uh, the beer because the very ancient method in China probably is very close to beer. When I talk about the beer, it's different from what we see in the, uh, in the supermarket, the, the, the beer with PTO. And the PTO is very much like a modern term, and they use hops to give this kind of bitterness taste. But the ancient beer uh, uh, did not use husk. Uh, the, uh, did not use hops. Uh, so, but we are going to talk about uh, um, the, the beer, ancient beer. Okay, so in order to turn the starchy food into sugar, um, and we have a, basically there are two message, uh, methods uh, can, can uh, accomplish this process. Uh, one is use sprouted grains, sprouted barley, wheat, or millet, uh, and the other is uh, what they call the mastication, which is use your saliva to chew and spit. So you have an enzyme existed in the saliva, and saliva would help to um, digest on, or turn the starch into sugar. So that is very simple. If you uh, chew uh, a piece of bread for a long time, and you begin to feel it turn into sweet, there is some sweetness, and that is the um, uh, the process of uh, um, starchy food turn into sugar. Um, and the second, you need to have a high temperature, not very high, not the boiling, but uh, around the 65 de degree, and that's called mashing. And that, uh, if you mash, sprout it, um, the grain, and then well, and it's uh, uh, then it's the second stage, and then naturally existed yeast in the air would come to uh, the uh, the mash, and then turn the sugar into an uh, alcohol. But you have to uh, put this uh, um, alcohol, this liquid, into a container and seal it. Uh, especially with the, this type of uh, uh, vessel. Wh whoops. Why? Okay. Uh, use it, this type of vessel because you can seal the, um, the open and then allow uh, the liquid become alcohol. And you cannot have oxygen coming into the pot because you need carbon dioxide uh, and alcohol. If you allow the oxygen coming into the pot or turn into vinegar, 
right? It's not alcohol anymore. So this is important to know the material basically uh, needed for making alcohol, right? Here, what, what are the, the basic material uh, necessary for making alcohol here? Starchy gran or uh, tuber, and you need some temperature to do the meshing, and then you need a container to hold the liquid for a um, long time, but maybe several days or maybe several months. It depends on how high the alcohol level you want. But the yeast is not very important because yeast exists in the air, so they can just wild yeast come to do the work. But the, the first stage is very important. You need to have um, either sprouted grant or you use human saliva. Okay, so this is a process help us to understand what are the necessary condition uh, to make alcohol and the necessary material and how archaeologist is to recover the residue of those material used for making alcohol. So if ancient people made alcohol with this process, uh, we can probably recover something from the pots. The pots used for stored alcohol and for number of, uh, for a long time, they, they, um, if you use repeatedly, the, the residue of the alcohol would stay on, on the surface. Um, it's the, this is a byproduct, it's not alcohol itself. Alcohol itself is ethanol, just evaporate. Um, so what we can uh, absorb from this, if this process happened, we can see the husk from the grains. If you sprout the grains, the husk is still there. You don't remove the husk. So the husk, um, can be seen under microscope, it's called fetalus. So fetalus is a type of, uh, um, almost like a stone, but it lasts for millions of years, it can be um, very easily preserved. And another is uh, starch, right? Starch is necessary for used to turn into sugar. And if there's a fermentation, the um, isom will uh, began to attack starch, turn that starch into sugar, and the when they turning uh, the starch into sugar, they um, attack the starch in certain way and leave the certain patterns on the starch grains, uh, which is uh, unique, uh, and we can reconstruct uh, the pattern of the damage. Uh, if you do the meshing, because the high temperature, the starch is going to gelatinize, and that also show damaged patterns. So if we can see the residue exists, this type of patterns, and we can reconstruct the um, uh, existence of the alcohol. Uh, and you can see here, this undamaged starch, and those are damaged starch. So those are the typical um, characteristics of uh, alcohol making. Uh, and we also know uh, that when people making alcohol, they would grind the, the grains into small pieces and it would be easy for the fermentation process. And this is uh, ethnographic examples from East Africa. You can see people uh, grind, uh, uh, sorghum into powder uh, and then use this pot, that what we call globular, uh, because of the shape, use this kind of pot to do the fermentation. Uh, and here you can see the pots were sealed. So this uh, process can be reconstructed based on ethnographic study. So the people today, the living people in Africa still doing this um, uh, alcohol making. Um, and a very similar process also exists in China. And that is an example from North Shanxi. They, not, they use um, millet to um, format. Uh, and that here is the process. It's slightly different from the East Africa. They uh, steamed uh, uh, millet 
powder, millilitre flour, uh, and then mix it with the yeast. The yeast was made, of, not yeast, the chu. Chu was made of uh, uh, sprouted uh, wheat. So all together, and then they put in the pot, you can see the very much like what we saw uh, in other parts of the world, a uh, big belly but a small opening, and put hot water, and then for one day, only one day, is uh, ready to drink. But the drink is, uh, is what they call the hunjiu. It's kind of muddy, uh, almost like a porridge. Uh, very low alcohol level, maybe less than 4% uh, percent alcohol. And that's very popular in North Shanxi. People, peasants still enjoy this kind of uh, drink during the holidays. Okay, so this vessel, we emphasize the ceramics. Uh, the, the typical shape of the vessel related to the alcohol can be um, compared with the, the Chinese characters of uh, jiu, alcohol. So there are two types of uh, uh, writing in oracle bone inscriptions. One is with the water particle, the other is uh, without water particle. So this is um, um, similar to the pot here, and that is the Shang Dynasty, uh, date about uh, three, more than 3,000 years ago. And this is the alcohol making pottery. Uh, and with the water particle just means the, the pot is filled with the alcohol. And this, um, the characters in the ancient, whoops, uh, in the ancient, um, writing an oracle bone inscription, so it's almost, almost identical to the way we are writing the jiu, uh, the alcohol, the word. It's the, not very much change. So here, the, what I want to emphasize is the shape of the vessel. Um, when we talk about the, the vessel, uh, the pottery, uh, we also want to understand uh, when this typical type of uh, alcohol making vessel uh, invented in China. Uh, and what is the, what was the earliest uh, pottery in China? Uh, China uh, together with the uh, two other regions in, the, in, in East Asia, one is in Japan, the other is the Far East Russia, um, together, um, account for the earliest invention of a pottery in the world. So the earliest one uh, date to about uh, 20,000 years ago, that's in China. And Japan and the Far, uh, far East uh, Russia is slightly later. And uh, we see they are all very simple form. Uh, they, they don't have a restricted opening. So it's not a beer um, vessel. Uh, probably they are used for making porridge. Uh, as we know, at this time, 20,000 years ago, people were mobile. They are moving around the hunter-gatherers. Uh, they probably uh, hung the deer and they collect the wild seeds. Um, and so they are, uh, when this type of the pottery uh, existed, they continue for about 10,000 years. So it's continue to make this very simple form of the pottery. And uh, together with the grinding stones, as what we saw in East Africa, uh, they use grinding stones to make, uh, uh, to break down the cereals and easy uh, to make uh, alcohol. So we see about 10,000 years ago, people still making uh, this kind of simple form the pottery, but at the same time they use grinding stones. So uh, they probably at this time still making porridge rather than uh, making alcohol. Uh, and that is a, about the, the time agriculture began about 10,000 years ago. So what happened in the later period? About 9,000 years ago, we began to see people settle down and began to cultivate uh, cereals like rice and millet. Uh, and then their uh, villages expanded to a larger area um, across the um, eastern part of China. Uh, and we see very similar tradition continued at this time. Uh, they use granite stones, although the granite stones become more elaborate. 
and they also use pottery. But at this time, about 9,000 years ago, the pottery form become a lot more diverse. So they have uh, cooking vessels, uh, they have uh, storage, uh, and they have also this type of vessel is uh, what we are looking for, uh, the globulars, uh, with a small opening, a big belly, as for storage of uh, liquid. And that is what we are targeting on, uh, and see if uh, this type of vessel uh, can give us evidence of um, alcohol making. So uh, if we look at this uh, distribution, so this kind of um, globular pottery jars, uh, existed in very large region from north to south, uh, from Yellow River to Yangtze River, uh, and they are extremely similar. Um, and archaeologists, uh, including uh, our team at Stanford, um, were the few uh, teams working on the uh, early alcohol. So here are the uh, examples um, the pottery have been analyzed. Um, this group is the earliest one, it's uh, from uh, Henan province. Uh, it's analyzed by um, Dr. Uh, McGovern from Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, but the rest are analyzed by us. So um, Patrick McGovern analyzed this uh, Jiahu, um, alcohol, uh, uh, Jiahu pottery and he used uh, chemical analysis and then he recovered uh, uh, some chemical uh, elements uh, which indicate uh, 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 rice, honey, and fruits were used for making alcohol. So this is the earliest example of alcohol in the world. Uh, so this alcohol was recreated by um, American beer company in Delaware, and then they labeled 9,000 years old alcohol. Uh, so that was uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, we analyzed uh, uh, several early pots, this kind of globulars, and we found not just the rice, uh, we, we studied their uh, fatalus and the starch. So it was different method from McGovern. And we found uh, rice and tubers, uh, including yam and uh, snake roots. Uh, Tritisia is a kind of wild, uh, wheat is not domesticated wheat, uh, and also we found the millet in this pot, and that is about 8,000 years old. Uh, um, and the other one is from Henan. Uh, the one I just showed is from Shandong, and this one is from Henan. And we, again, we found uh, a millet and tritisia and some gelatinized starch. So as we uh, mentioned that uh, meshing would require uh, high temperature, and that would uh, uh, make the starch gelatinized. So those are the good evidence to indicate this kind of a globular parts were used for making alcohol, not just uh, um, uh, uh, porridge. Okay, so those are the earliest examples of alcohol. And what happened in slightly later time, say uh, 7,000 years ago to about 4,500 years ago. And that this time we again look at the pottery differences um, in uh, uh, different regions. Uh, we can see there are two major traditions of pottery typology. Uh, in the West, uh, west, uh, uh, northwest region, we see the pottery is a, uh, have very simple form, uh, the round or uh, flat bottom without uh, uh, handles or legs. Um, and uh, the east coast region, we have more sophisticated styles of pottery, uh, the made of uh, um, with the legs, the long legs, the short legs, uh, and handles and spots, uh, very long stands. Um, and we see many of those East Coast uh, pottery were used uh, as drinking vessels. 
So this is for drinking, and that's probably for serving or pouring the alcohol to the goblets. So this is a quite a different tradition if you compare to the West. So why they are different, and what is the implication of this kind of a ceramic, a different ceramic typology? If we look at the East Coast first, uh, and we see, um, okay, uh, these drinking tra vessels were uh, normally used uh, for um, burial uh, in the mortuary, uh, in the mortuary context. So that means found in the tombs. Uh, and for example, this tomb uh, is uh, um, date to about uh, uh, 5,000, more than 5,000 years ago. And then they have the goblets, something like that. There were 37 goblets uh, placed on the top of the uh, skeletons. I, and certainly it's uh, more than one person needs to eat, to drink, right? So that's many interpretations of why there are 37 goblets associated one, with one dead person. And many people believe uh, indicated his social, social status, he has a, so a high social status, and also probably suggest that um, people come to the funeral uh, with drink, and then when, we fin when they finish the f uh, funeral ritual, they left their goblets in the tomb. So that is another interpretation, but any interpretation would uh, lead to one suggestion is that this individual enjoyed high social status. And all those, uh, uh, the ceramics, uh, the, um, this, this grief um, goods would indicate the individual differences in the society. So very much emphasized on uh, individual social um, hierarchy. Um, and we analyzed, uh, uh, again, the uh, pottery from this East Coast region, uh, date from 6,000 to about 4,000 years ago. And uh, we found uh, starch and featherless uh, in the uh, vessels. And there's a drinking vessel or, or a pouring vessels. Uh, and the, we can see the damaged starch here. It's very much similar to uh, the fermentation process. So that, uh, and we also found the rice husk. Uh, so we, uh, the, uh, the type of uh, uh, plants include tubers, tritisia, millet, rice, and other things. Uh, so this is a very long tradition uh, in the East Coast uh, using uh, this uh, elaborate drinking vessels. Okay, now we look at the, the West tradition. Uh, that is called Yangshao culture. Um, a date from about 5,000 to uh, 3,000 BC. So that uh, is uh, about 7,000 to 5,000 years ago. Uh, at those uh, pottery I showed before, uh, they are uh, rather simple in form, but they are all painted. Um, and, uh, if we look at uh, uh, the burial patterns, uh, they are quite different from the East Coast. So here was an example, uh, just the, there are different type of burials, but the most uh, interesting one is this kind of a secondary collective burials. It's very much like a, a South China tradition, and it's the primary burial is uh, your one person died, you bury them first, and then after 10 or some years, you collect the bones, uh, and put it in the pot and then buried with the, your relatives together in, the, in another tomb. So here is uh, uh, the collective of secondary burials and sometimes it's uh, 70, 80 individuals buried together in the tomb. Uh, and what we want to say is very few pottery vessels found in this kind of tomb. So the, the pottery vessels were um, put in the tomb not for any specific individuals, but it's for the group, uh, for the group to share. So this is the, a tradition very much emphasized on the group value, uh, collective, uh, collective uh, value. Uh, uh, okay, so what the problem is, did they drink alcohol? Did they make alcohol if we don't see cups uh, or drinking vessels? 
So we see the two, um, the, these two examples of a jar, we call that jian di ping, so it means the pointed bottom jar is very much uh, like uh, uh, amphora in, uh, Egypt, in, in Egypt and uh, in Mes uh, Mesopotamia as well as uh, uh, in Greek, Greek and Roman. Um, then the, this kind of jar um, is very typical of Yangshao culture. Uh, many people, archaeologists, believe they were just water jars, the use for carrying water, and that become uh, a symbolic object uh, to characterize this, uh, the uh, Yangshao society. And even the, the museum would uh, uh, show children how this kind of jar can be used for carrying water. But uh, I think that it's too small and people normally carry water with buckets rather than with this kind of small uh, heavy jar. So we also um, pay attention to the residue uh, inside of this jar and we see they have very thick yellowish or white color residue that's not from water. Um, and we, another interesting thing is that in the early Yangshao period, we see more small jars and fewer big jars, uh, the same shape, but towards the late Yangshao period, middle and late Yangshao period, uh, this uh, um, emperor become bigger and bigger, sometimes longer than one meter. So it's, it's difficult to carry, uh, and some with no handles. So it's just not for water carrying. Okay, so we analyzed the three sites uh, in the Wei River near Xi'an area. Uh, everybody knows Xi'an, where Xi'an is. So those, uh, some are uh, the large, very large jian uh, ping, the, the uh, point at the bottom ones, uh, some small ones, and uh, uh, associate with this type of jars or uh, the funnels. Uh, so all those three sites um, one is called Mi Jia Ya, uh, the other is called Yang Guan Zhai, and the other, third one is called Xin Jie. Uh, they to uh, about uh, uh, almost 6,000 to uh, 5,000 years ago. And uh, this uh, set of vessels, very similar to a modern um, workshop, the, the uh, Huang Jiu making uh, workshop. And you can see here, they use funnels and the large, um, um, vessel for meshing and a small open, a small uh, mouth and a tall jar for um, storage. And just like what we see here, uh, then we have large jar for um, meshing and a funnel and a small uh, mouth, the uh, pointed bottom jars. Uh, and we collected the sample with the different ways, uh, either scrape off the surface, uh, the uh, residue, or we use ultrasonic baths to um, shake off the residue. And we analyzed it in the lab uh, for starch and for fatalus. So our results suggest that uh, um, the residue contained uh, damage to starch, very similar to fermentation, and also fatalus from husks. And those husks uh, identified to um, both barley and um, millet. Uh, and we see those are the damaged starch, um, <clears throat> identical to the uh, fermentation ones from our experimental study. Uh, and the chemical analysis also suggests there are special type of uh, uh, um, chemicals called uh, oxalate, and that's uh, associated with the beer making. Um, okay, so now we can, um, we are, we're quite sure uh, they were used for making alcohol uh, and also <clears throat> probably for storage. But now the question is how did they drink? Um, we, as we mentioned, there are uh, very few cups. And how did they drink alcohol with the one meter tall jar? I, and uh, we found <coughs> on the surface of this uh, uh, opening, they were damaged on, uh, on the rim, and also some are very <coughs> vertical striations. 
on, from this vessel. <laughs> so there are some kind of uh, plants in context with the, uh, with the vessel cause the situation, cause those kind of damage. Um, what kind of uh, uh, plants can cause this damage and why? So that is uh, interesting, and uh, we compare with the um, ancient examples from Near East and Egypt. Um, uh, you can see the very similar jar, this pointed bottom jar, um, depicted in uh, the tablets in Mesopotamia. And also, there are two people who seem to drink uh, something from the, this big jar with the uh, uh, straws. And the straws were made of reeds. Um, and here is a very similar um, <clears throat> scene with the two people drinking with the, from uh, a jar of uh, amphora uh, with the reeds. And that is uh, from Egyptian um, the painting. And the, we see very clearly that the small jar was uh, used for drinking through a reeds. So this kind of a drinking with the reeds the, um, is a quite uh, uh, popular uh, in, in East Africa. And we can see here there's group drinking, there's communal drinking. Uh, each person uh, would use a, st a straw made of reeds. And uh, this kind of uh, um, drinking um, activities would possibly cause the situation on the rim if the pottery is soft. If it's very hard, you would not see any damage, but if it's soft, it will cause the damage. And that is uh, some of the Yangshao pottery. It's not very high temperature, it's rather soft. Okay, so this tradition also can be found in China. So it's not just in other parts of the world. In, in China, especially in the Southwest region, um, like uh, in Yunnan, in Sichuan, um, the people drink uh, as a group. Uh, they come to drink either as the same age, but the same sex, um, women, uh, women or men, they are, uh, looks like the old, uh, old man or old young ladies. Uh, if they come with the family, they are men or women, but they are all belong to the same generation. So when they come, to drink as family, they normally go from the elders to the, the younger by generation. So there's still social hierarchy involved, but it's not very much emphasized on individual. It's emphasized on the group uh, solidarity. So there are uh, many different occasions they would have this, uh, this kind of drinking, um, but there's all uh, like collective activities. Um, then people, when they drink, they not just drink, they have other activities like uh, uh, dancing or they singing songs. Uh, then they, this kind of a celebration would happen very often through the years. But uh, what seems to be very common b uh, between this modern ethnic um, examples and uh, the Yangshao culture in ancient times is that they emphasized on group value and uh, a group solidarity. They all work together, drink together uh, as a collective um, um, activity. And we see in the ancient uh, artifacts, in the painted pottery, this kind of dancing scene were depicted. Uh, and probably this is all women and that's all men. So very much like what we see today in this uh, uh, rather isolated ethnic groups uh, in the mountain areas. And uh, here we see the, the pottery were um, a lot of them made in the shape of a holding liquid. <coughs> that is from the Gansu area. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, summarize. <coughs> If we go back to these uh, two traditions, one is the East, one is in the West. In the East, we see, um, okay, so in the East, we see people drink with the elaborate drinking vessels, small cups, 
uh, and pouring vessels, and they drink individually. Uh, so that tradition uh, seems to uh, emphasize the uh, individual social status, uh, and society is rather uh, developed in terms of social hierarchy. On the other hand, is in the West, and the people drink together um, as a group and they use a very large vessel. It's not a very elaborate made, and it's a, um, everybody can make it, and we found very common in almost every household. So that is not something uh, only elite uh, can have, can make, but that is a very uh, different traditions. Uh, and here, this kind of a um, group-oriented society seems to be very similar to the uh, Southwest ethnic groups in China today. Uh, but this individualized drinking tradition uh, seems to um, very resembling the uh, more civilized social organization. And after the Yangshao culture, about uh, um, 5,000 years ago, um, the emperor disappeared. Uh, the Yangshao culture disappeared and emperor disappeared. Uh, the, but at the same time, the East tradition seems to expand it towards the West. So we see the vessels similar to the East Coast uh, began to occur in the yellow, uh, middle Yellow River and a very large region. So it seems that this uh, drinking tradition emphasizes that individuals uh, become more accepted by a um, much broader region. Uh, and uh, this tradition uh, seems to continue to the Bronze Age. As we know, those are the examples of the earliest uh, bronze vessels in China, and they are all drinking vessels. And that they are used for drinking uh, and serving. Uh, and that's the uh, early Tao period, and that's the Shang Dynasty. And probably you, if you go to the uh, museum, you'll see a lot of these things, and they were all drinking vessels. As we understand, the Shang uh, Dynasty in Anyang, the, the tombs, um, they, uh, well, archaeologists found a lot of bronze, but 70% of the bronze vessels are drinking vessels. So this is a very strong cultural tradition in China. Um, at the same time, we see um, the old Yangshao tradition disappeared, but seems they only survived in uh, southwest China area. And today we can still see them in the ethnic groups. Um, so the Chinese civilization uh, the core of civilization is social hierarchy. And, we, and that is the right, or we call the li. So you have to understand uh, who you are and your position in the world and in the surrounding. So that is the drinking vessel, emphasize that individuals help to uh, facilitate, um, to recognize or to establish this kind of social hierarchy. Uh, as we see, the, the core of the Chinese civilization can be found in these uh, ritual traditions. And the, the ritual tradition also closely related to how people drink. And that's all the core of the Chinese civilization. And we see this kind of drinking tradition, use drinking um, to uh, distinguish social hierarchy or social status still exists today. So if you go to, uh, this is just, I go online and the, the, uh, I type the uh, drinking um, ritual and they come with this. So what does it mean? The probably is not very popular in Hong Kong, but it's very clear in North China, especially in the Henan or uh, this Yellow River area where is the core area of the early Chinese civilization. is uh, when you toast, um, you should hold your glass lower than um, the other person to show your respect. 
So that is the way to distinguish differences between individuals, and that's very subtle. Uh, but we can see this behavior was used in diplomatic occasions. Here, primary, Zhou Enlai, when he told uh, Nixon his glass is lower than, than Nixon's glass, and when Xi Jinping told the Queen and his glass is lower than Queen's glass. So that is, uh, uh, Chinese all understand this, uh, why uh, the position is uh, uh, made in this way, but maybe Nixon and Quinn did not understand. But it's for the Chinese, it was make a lot of sense to use this kind of subtle behavior to show the level of civilization. And you probably would not imagine, you know, people uh, in, in palace would bring a big jar of beer and everybody drink from the straws. So they would not very civilized, right? Okay, so here our um, the funding of a, a beer, especially the Mi Jiaya beer, was uh, recreated by three um, beer companies. One is uh, in Hong Kong and the, the um, the founder of the company, Moon Zin, is here today. Uh, we were very lucky to have him. Uh, and they, oops. Uh, they, uh, and the other is uh, Jing A from Beijing. So the two uh, owners of the com beer companies went to uh, Shanxi province to visit the um, excavators. And then, then uh, they went to the storage room and to look at uh, uh, the point at the bottom uh, jars, the uh, Jianli Ping, uh, and then they create, recreated the beer uh, based on what we found in, uh, in the uh, in, in, in ingredients of the, the ancient beer. And here are the Mi Jiaya beer recreated by Meng Zun, and that is uh, uh, the one uh, recreated by Jing A. Um, so, uh, you can try, uh, it's available in Hong Kong. <laughs> you probably can communicate <laughs> with, the, with the Moon Sun's, uh, um, the founder here. Uh, and uh, the third one is from American in Seattle. Uh, and they recreate uh, uh, beer, it's also called Mi Jiaya, historical Chinese beer. And I tasted this one as well. There's uh, similar to beer, but not the same. It's slightly sour and slightly sweet. Um, so this is uh, our uh, teamwork. Uh, it's, uh, uh, some of our team members, uh, they're all female archeologists. Uh, <laughs> we don't really enjoy alcohol, but we enjoy um, re uh, discover the ancient alcohol. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the project was uh, generally supported by um, Mrs. Ming Kuang, and he supported our uh, Chinese archaeology program at the Stanford. So last, I want to show that uh, uh, we have uh, reporters from the CCTV uh, did uh, uh, a sh very short video. Well, how come I, I could not find the... So this is the excavation the site in Shanxi CCTV province in northern China, Stanford. remnants of these pottery oh, vessels were it's discovered. It's sure. And at Stanford University in California, Professor Liu Li and researcher Jia Jing sure. Wang have determined they were part of a beer making toolkit. If we can start. Sorry.
Okay. I think that you Okay, maybe you uh, at the same time we can we can uh, uh, Sorry. take some questions. At the Mijiaya excavation site in Shanxi province in northern China, remnants of these pottery vessels were discovered. And at Stanford University in California, Professor Liu Li and researcher Jia Jing Wang have determined they were part of a beer-making toolkit. If reconstructed, one of the vessels would look like this. The idea is they would drink together as a group. These are microscopic starch grains from the vessels, an ancient beer recipe that includes millet, yam, and snake gourd root, and a type of branched grass called Job's Tears. Because the size is more like a Job's Tears. And finally, there's barley. The barley is rather surprising because normally people believe, archaeologists believe barley was introduced to China about 4,000 years ago, but our pottery date to 5,000 years ago. And the function of beer is more than just regular food and involved a more a social complexity, like a social hierarchy and the elite would use alcohol to gain power and to maintain power. In Professor Liu's archaeology of food class, power fell into the hands of students who used ingredients from the 5,000 year old recipe to make their own beer. And these are the concoctions the students have made and the researchers have also experimented with. I'm going to try one of Jia Jing's uh, favorites, the millet. And I'll sip from a straw like was typically done in ancient cultures. Not bad, it's got a lot of flavor. A little bit of sourness too, right? Mm -hmm. Sourness and sweetness. And then mm -hmm. I tried her least favorite, the one with snake gourd root and malted barley. More, more sour. Some of the ingredients we found ha are used for medicinal purposes today. If any modern brewery can incorporate those ingredients, they can advertise some healthy beer to the markets. In fact, Lucky Envelope Brewing in Seattle has already taken the recipe and brewed its own Mijaya historic Chinese beer. The brewmaster there says initial curiosity has given way to customers regularly asking when it'll be back on tap. It's an ancient recipe proving to be ripe for appreciation and experimentation. Cheers, cheers. Rice and honey, a new flavor. Okay. Mark New, CGTN, Stanford, California. Oh.